This week we're going to look at some volcanoes. So the lab will focus on the volcanic rocks and the lecture portion will focus just on volcanoes and volcano types and how uh, rock composition or magma composition is going to dictate the types of volcanoes we see and some of the different hazards we see. So as we cruise through some of the stuff, so the slides I'm just going to uh, same thing with I've done before with the PowerPoints. It's just a quick little Reader's Digest kind of overview of the PowerPoint. So there's more information in here that I want you to go through. In addition, I'm going to give you a little PDF of a chapter from an online book about volcanoes to clarify some of the stuff here. So and with both of those resources, hopefully we'll have a good handle on uh, volcanoes. So obviously, uh, Mount St. Helens is a famous volcano that erupted relatively recently. Um, so some images of before and after just show you the amount of power potentially that some volcanoes have. To go from something like that to that is uh, takes a lot of energy for sure. And so what we want to look at is initially what's causing these types of eruptions and are there different kinds? And, and we know there are, right? We know that there's more violent eruptions, things that have uh, a lot of force to them. They're ejecting a lot of material. But I'm sure you've seen videos from Hawaii that show a uh, more fluid lava and eruption types, not something quite so violent. And so what we're looking at is what's, what's driving that difference. And there's a couple things that are really driving that difference. One is that there is some water in the magma. And I know it sounds odd to think that there's water in magma because it's so hot, but you have to think of kind of molecular water, right? Things that are attached to other elements and and stuff like that but it still has the same properties as water and one of those things is that when the water changes phases it expands and besides just water there's other gases that are trapped in there and so when we have the water changing phase we can have it uh, expand so think about uh, your radiator in your car potentially you have water in the radiator and it's under pressure this is why the, the water in the magma isn't turning to gas instantly even though it's hot is the remember the pressure is fighting that phase change and so when it's under a lot of weight a lot of pressure even though it exceeds potentially the, the changing temperature which would change from a liquid to a gas at the surface underneath the ground under a lot of pressure that temperature is a lot higher and so it'll remain a liquid until we can reduce the pressure and a lot of times what happens is an earthquake will occur causing a fracture which will allow the pressure to be reduced there. And then we can have this change from a liquid phase to a gaseous phase, which means that it then expands rapidly and that can propel this big eruption here. So when we look at uh, eruption types, we're gonna look at what's dissolved in the magma, waters and gases. And then the other is the viscosity. And so this is where we go to the composition of the magma is one of the things that controls the types we get and the types of hazards we get. Because when we look at magmas, we can look at their compositions. When we use igneous rock composition terms, we use the term mafic, intermediate, and felsic. We kind of introduce that in our plutonic rocks, and this is how we identify rocks based on their composition. And the good news is we can use some color to help us with that. So we don't have to take a piece back to the lab every time and analyze it. We can make a general kind of compositional guess based on its color. And so what we see is the rocks that are dark in color, especially when we're talking about volcanic rocks, where the crystals are really small, you can't see them very well or at all. And so we look at the overall composition and our dark colored igneous rocks indicate a mafic composition, which means it has a low silica content. So we are going to equate silica with viscosity. If you have low silica, you have a low viscosity, which means low resistance to flow. And so it likes to flow easily. So it's right, low silica, low viscosity. That means runny. And so the idea is that if there is waters and gases in the magma, it can escape pretty easily. And so it bubbles out or escapes. And so we don't have this pressure buildup. But in higher viscosity magmas, and this is the felsic and intermediate lavas, they have more silica, SiO2, which means they have a higher viscosity, they're thicker, so those gases and waters that are in there cannot escape, they're trapped. 
They're trying to get out, but they can't. And so they build pressure and that can help drive these eruptions. So I don't want you to forget these terms here, right? Mafic, intermediate, and felsic. We did introduce those two. But we can go through some volcano types and use these compositions to kind of group them and look at their um, hazards. And so real quick, I'll, I'll throw out a couple that we're going to go through in just a second. But you know, a shield volcano is a mafic type of volcano. And an example would be Hawaii. And the reason Hawaii looks like Hawaii in this idea that it's a very broad and flat volcano. It's not the typical volcano you think of. You think of kind of Mount Fuji or Mount St. Helens or Mount Hood or Mount Bachelor. These are these are intermediate type volcanoes, but the mafic ones are these really broad and flat. Why? It's low viscosity. Their composition is dictating their shape. And so they're very fluid. They run for really long distances, so they can't really build up a really steep-sided volcano. In addition, besides telling us its shape and what it looks like, it's also telling us some of the hazards. They're not as violent. So lava flows are certainly a hazard with mafic volcanoes because they can flow long distances, and that can be a problem. But we don't get these big blasts. We don't get some of these other hazards like uh, mud flows, lahars that are called, or pyroclastic flows things like that. As we move down into the intermediate phase, this is where things can start to get a little problematic when it comes to hazards. Intermediate, we're talking, these are the Mount St. Helen type volcanoes. So they have more silica enough to cause violence. Now they get two phases here. They can have some lava flows, although they don't flow very far, and they can have blast eruptions. And so they can get a little of both. So because they're in the middle, they get a little of everything. And then as we go down to felsic, if there's a lot of gas and water dissolved, and these are the, in theory, the, you know, global killers. The, if you watch the Discovery Channel, we're all going to die because Yellowstone is going to erupt and kill everybody. And hopefully that's not true, but the idea behind that is the super thick felsic magmas trap an enormous amount of gas, which leads to enormous eruptions that can blast an incredible amount of material into the atmosphere and cause problems with uh, climate change and, of course, these large eruptions and blasts can, can kill people over a larger distance. And so the deal with that is, remember, there are many, many, many more intermediate type volcanoes than there are these big felsic type volcanoes. And so although the felsic ones are the most violent and potentially can cause the most damage, they're very rare. They never really occur in, in human history that we can document. But here, intermediate ones, these are our composite or stratovolcanoes. They're everywhere. There's hundreds, thousands of these, and they're erupting all the time. So we focus our energy on these intermediates because they have the most impact on society, as opposed to these super volcanoes that erupt maybe once every 100 to 500,000 years. Devastating, of course, but they're not as problematic for us in our everyday life. So I'm going to just cruise through really fast. Uh, okay, let me go back to this for a second. So remember, there is a correlation here between our plate tectonic story and our volcanic locations. Almost all volcanoes are caused by plate tectonic boundary interactions. The intermediate ones I was just talking about, subduction. Right? So when we subduct, we have a mechanism for causing melting to occur, and that allows our volcanoes to form here. So subduction zones here and here all along the uh, west coast of South America, up here in Washington and Oregon, we have subduction going on. Or here in Japan and Indonesia, we have lots of subduction going on. These are causing the majority of our volcanoes. Certainly, there's volcanic activity at spreading ridges, though rarely do they form these large volcanoes that come above wave base and form some problem for us. So there's volcanic activity, but we don't, we don't really identify many volcanoes under the ocean here. There are some examples or exceptions like Hawaii. That's a hot spot. There's still a process there for causing magma to melt, and that's why we have those volcanoes there. Okay, so how the rest of the slides are going to be set up is I'm going to talk about a volcano. Here's the characteristics, and here's what uh, the characteristics are for each of the volcanoes. So we said shield volcanoes. These are our mafic ones, so they form broad and flat. They're not very violent because they have a low... Uh, silica content, which means they have a low viscosity, and so not a lot of gas is trapped in there, so they don't erupt very violently.
and then we cruise through and each one is going to have some examples of um, some volcanoes that you can look at here in Arizona and so certainly uh, there's not a lot of uh, shield volcanoes here in Arizona but there is some examples of some small ones and Joe's Hill here is one of them and then of course we have some cinder cones so look, if you look at the color here, it's still dark. So we're still in the mafic category, but we've kind of moved down closer to the intermediate phase. So it's kind of in the middle between mafic and intermediate, which means there's a little more gas content. It's a little thicker, so it's slightly more violent. But these are usually some short, short-lived kind of uh, eruptions, and so they can be associated with almost any type of boundary. So anywhere you have volcanic activity, you can get these. But once again, like if we looked at uh, the Cascade Range, there is subduction happening there. We would expect to see intermediate type eruptions at a subduction zone. Why? Remember, the initial melt from subduction is mafic. As it rises up, it can interact with the continental crust, which is felsic. You take mafic, you take felsic, they mix together, they get intermediate. And so the majority of the volcanism at subduction zones is going to be intermediate, which means you're going to get, as we cruise through, our stratovolcanoes. They dominate at these subduction zones. Does that mean you can't get cinder cones there? It doesn't mean that. Because remember, our magma chamber evolves over time, and it changes a little bit to the mafic side, a little bit to the felsic side. But in general, at subduction zones, the dominant types of Material is intermediate, though we can get some some shift back and forth, which means we can get cinder cones at those locations too. But here's our dominant type of volcanoes that we see. You can use the term stratovolcanoes or composite, whichever you'd like. And of course, these have the potential to be very violent. That's because their magma is thick enough and it traps enough gas that pressure can build. And so at times we can get these very violent eruptions other times we get flows that come out and that helps build my steep sided volcano because the flows are pretty thick they don't go very far so we can build a steep sided volcano and some locations where we see those the san francisco peaks are actually an example of a strato volcano you can kind of tell by the steep sided look of it it's erupted in such a way that it's kind of blew off its top there almost like mount st helens might have done some comparisons between the types of volcanoes we just went through to give you an idea of size, right? So these uh, shield volcanoes are huge because why? They flow very far. And then in comparison, you know, Mount Rainier, a stratovolcano looks tiny compared to that. And in our little uh, cinder cones, which tend to be short-lived kind of small features, you can see in comparison to Mount Rainier, they're fairly small. And let's see. We do get some smaller felsic eruptive materials called lava domes. They're usually associated with stratovolcanoes when there's a composition change in the magma chamber. They tend not to be extremely explosive because the gas content means it tends to be kind of low here. But they're super thick, so they can't flow very far. An example would be in this picture here, that's the lava dome, just that tiny little feature after this huge eruption occurred. So we had a big blast and then a secondary the feature grew in the crater here that was a lava dome because it was a little thicker. But when we think about big felsic magma eruptions, we think about what's called a caldera type eruption. And the example of that would be Yellowstone. So Yellowstone has a huge magma chamber sitting underneath it. It has a largely felsic composition, which means it's super thick. There's lots of gases trapped in there, in there, and it has the potential to be a massive eruption, which can basically destroy the volcanic features above it and eject thousands of kilometers of material into the air, cover large amounts of areas, and eject lots of material into the atmosphere, which would block out the sunlight cause lots of problems for us if we had a kind of volcanic winter or things like that. So this is why these are so problematic. And then there's a few more. There is an example of a uh, felsic eruption, one that we would see a caldera type. That's the Superstition Mountains. And then 
there just to go into right there is volcanism remember at mid-ocean ridges so i don't want you to think that there's no volcanic activity you don't know, define those as volcanoes but what should they be they are very mafic because the melt comes up from the mantle partially melting it giving me a mafic melt the ocean crust is mafic so i don't have any new ingredients that change its composition so they should be very mafic very low violence because of their composition and so we tend to get just mafic material being ejected there or extruded out there we also get these flood basalts that occasionally happen where we can have magma that makes it to the surface in the, on the continents the idea is that the mafic magma does not interact very well with the continental crust and that could be that the crust is highly fractured so the magma can move through fairly easily without incorporating lots of felsic material. So it gets to the surface and it produces these big, huge eruptions of basalt. But because they're huge, means they cover a large area, but not necessarily explosive. And so they can flow for long distances and cover large areas. Why? Because they're very mafic. So, but even though they're on the continental crust, they're not interacting much with that felsic continental crust. And so, that mafic melt that comes from the mantle makes it to the surface and just flows out on the surface everywhere. And one of those examples is in Oregon, Washington, we have or the uh, Columbia River basalts. These are these big flood basalts. They happen in other areas too. So there are some exceptions to the rules there you have to be aware of. Here's just a summary of all the different types of landforms and their properties. So look through this, of course, and then uh, Check out the little chapter that I'm going to post with this is the, uh, uh, what, the Volcano chapter. It's an online book. I think that I mentioned to you in the early in the syllabus if you wanted to look through that book. But I just kind of pulled out that one chapter, and I'll put that in the, in the lecture material. Okay.